I haven't been doing this, but maybe it wouldn't uh, hurt. We're a little ahead of schedule. Maybe if the other board members could just introduce themselves so that Alan would know everybody. Um, why don't we go in alphabetical order, Jess? Sure. Hi, Alan. How are you? I'm Jessica Holmes, and um, I've been on the board now six years. Hi, I'm Robin Lunge. Um, I'm I work prior to this in health policy for uh, various parts of state government, and I've been on the board for four years. Nice to meet you. Good morning. This is uh, Tom Pelham in chilly Berlin, Vermont this morning. A lot of dew on the ground. Uh, I've been on the board for two and a half years. Um, prior to that, I was uh, the state's finance commissioner and tax commissioner and had some other jobs, but uh, uh, this is certainly a challenge. Nice to meet you. Hi, Maureen Yusufer. Um, I've been on the board for just a little over three years, three and a half years, and my background is uh, corporate finance and CFO of several companies. Nice to meet you also. Okay, do we have the court reporter on? Yes, I'm here, Joanne Carson. Good morning, Joanne. Good morning. Um, we only had um, one, uh, a couple of situations on Tuesday where um, people started to get jumbled, but any time that you need to uh, ask somebody to repeat or just jump in, okay, Joanne? I will do that, thank you. Okay, and I I guess we'll officially kick things off. My name is Kevin Mullen, Chair of the Green Mountain Care Board. Um, I want to uh, start by saying that um, please refrain from using the chat function. Um, the chat function is not a method to um, create a public comment. Um, we will take public comment on each of the three budgets that we hear today after each presentation. So um, with that, Joanne, could you swear in our witnesses from Springfield? Sure, I would ask you each to raise your right hands, please. Do you swear the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. I do. Thank you. And Mike, I assume it's just you and Alan. That's that's correct. Great. So, uh, Mike, whenever you're ready, you can uh, go ahead and take it away. Well, um, now that my support just left my office, I'm trying to figure out how to get to the. Oh, there it is, I guess. Screen share. Yep. And uh, I think it's the presentation. <laughs> and I think I have to get into slide show. Well, it's good that we're seeing Springfield Hospital fiscal year 21 budget presentation. That's a good sign. Yeah, I think so. There's uh, a little down at the very bottom, Mike, about four icons to the right. You can click on it. It's a, like a quick button. It goes right to the slide. Is that button. it? Am I, am I now on a... Oh, boy. I'm not sure why I got a... I got a big echo. Do you guys have big echo? Um. It seemed to have gone away with your last statement. Sometimes we get echoes when people are both on a phone and using the computer at the same time, or sometimes it's just that um, uh, some people's uh, mics are a little bit more sensitive. So we ask people to mute themselves if they're not speaking. Okay, is that is that better? It you, is. Are you able to hear me okay? Yes. All right, well, uh, yes, it's just gonna be Alan and myself making a presentation today. I think we have a number of folks from the hospital and supporters of the hospital that may try to, to sign on and, and listen. Um, but it's just the two of us today. Um, it, it's almost hard for me to believe that it's been a year <laughs> since the last time we were together as a group like this, uh, presenting the fiscal year 20 uh, budget. Um, and that at that time, if you recall, that was Tom Marshall and myself. Um, it's a it's a real shame that we can't be together um, in the same room. Um, I, I know most of our business is conducted these days by Zoom, so uh, we're getting better at it. And probably by the time we get better at it is when we'll get control of this pandemic and not have to do it anymore. So uh, anyway. Um, what we want to try to do this morning uh, is to 
uh, for Alan and I to, to walk you through a number of slides uh, that we have. And I don't know if you've seen them before uh, this presentation this morning or not. Um, but what we're going to try to do is to um, uh, show you where we've come with this organization since 2018. Um, and, and I hope you can appreciate um, that the situation here uh, back in 2018 uh, was pretty dire. Um, and we've come a long way and there's been a lot of hard work uh, by um, a number of folks here at the hospital and the medical staff, um, the nurses, um, there's been a lot of dedicated effort that's gone into uh, getting us to where we are today. And hopefully these slides will show you where we want to try to get to uh, in transitioning this organization um, so that we can continue to provide care to the community. And I think that's the most important thing, um, that uh, goal that we can have. And so um, uh, that's what our slides are going to try to, to, to show you. Um, let me go to the first slide if I can figure out. Whoop. Uh, too fast. There we go. Um, just to give you a little bit of a, uh, a refresher on, on who we are. Um, we're a hospital, a critical access uh, designation with Medicare. Uh, and we're affiliated with an organization called Springfield Medical Care Systems uh, that basically operates a federally qualified health clinic. Um, and uh, that's how we operate. The, the clinic basically has uh, the primary care physicians uh, that work with the hospital. The hospital does employ the specialty uh, physicians, um, but we do not have any primary care um, physicians employed by the hospital. So it's vitally critical that we operate together uh, in a collaborative fashion between the federally qualified health clinic and the hospital. That's going to be the success for both organizations. Um, the hospital itself, where we'll focus on today, uh, has an average daily census of, of 12 patients a day. Uh, we have a distinct part a psychiatric unit that is off campus. Uh, it's uh, about 10, 12 miles uh, from the main campus of the hospital. Uh, and it has, on average, about seven patients a day. Um, the uh, ED, which I don't have a point on, a bullet point on, just to give you a little uh, knowledge about the ED, because that's a very vital part of our uh, organization. Uh, the emergency room um, back in 2019 uh, had about four, a little over 14,000 ER visits. That's about 39 on average a day um, for the period of uh, January uh, uh, through February of 2020. Uh, we had about uh, 2,500, um, about 42 patients a day. Uh, and and I cut off at February because that's kind of the pre-COVID uh, period of time that we like to refer to. Um, then the period from March through July. Hey Mike, um, I hate to interrupt, but we're still seeing the, uh, the uh, cover slide. Um. Oh, boy, and I'm seeing the second slide, so I don't know why that is. So you're not seeing... I am not seeing the second slide. Is anybody else seeing the second slide? No. No. Oh boy. Um, and I am not the best technological person. Let me. See. One of the things I think is you're sharing your um, your desktop. You might want to share um, the presentation versus the desktop. We are seeing it now. But yeah, yep. what you might want to do is X out of all the individual slides that we see on the one side of your screen. How's there that? Yeah. yeah, that's better. And we now we are seeing you flip through. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. So I'm back on that. All right. Sorry about all of that technology. Um, Not a problem. <laughs> glad, glad you guys can help me with that. Um, I, yeah, I really Marine. do. I, I, I really do would rather be in person, I'll tell you. Um, so we were talking about the ED visits. Uh, Pre-COVID, uh, we were running around 42 visits a day in the ED compared to the 39 we had the year before. Uh, for the period of, of March through July, uh, which is all actual, um, our ED visits have gone down to 
uh, an average of about 29 patients a day. Um, so you can see what we've been seeing is a, that's one of the key areas that we've seen the impact of uh, the pandemic is in our ED visits. Um, and we'll talk a little bit later about what we think some of the causes, but many of you probably can figure out what those causes are. Um, the next bullet down then uh, on the particular slide indicates that you know we are an organization that's in chapter 11 uh, reorganization. We're in that process. We entered that um, on June 26th of 2019. Um, we do have a plan uh, that we've developed uh, for exiting that reorganization process. Uh, we expect to be submitting that within 60 days. Uh, we're targeting for the mid latter part of September, so it could be uh, sooner than that 60 day period. Uh, we'll also talk a little bit further in detail about that. Uh, the hospital today has 56 days cash on hand um, as of June 30th, and uh, we're predicting to have close to 36 days uh, when we um, file our exit plan. Are you guys seeing the third slide now? Yes. Okay, great. Um, we believe um, the operations can be sustainable going into the future based on four major elements. One is we conducted uh, pretty significant cost reductions that were executed in the early part of calendar year 2019, around February and March of 2019. We've, we're continuing that effort to uh, have initiatives to achieve services and economic efficiency. So we're looking every day at how we can change our uh, services to be more effective and efficient. And we've got a number of those things that we'll I talk about in a few minutes. Um, the third major component, uh, which is really the very, very difficult thing to do today is to try to predict what the patient volumes are. And what we're doing right now is we're anticipating that our patient volumes will be back to pre-COVID levels uh, around October 1st of this calendar year, which is the start of our fiscal year. You'll see all the projections assume that, um, but that's key to the, our component to being sustainable. And then the last major piece uh, is that we have to have a successful exit from chapter 11 uh, reorganization. That means that we have to have the cash available to negotiate with the major creditors uh, that we have at the uh, with the hospital um, to be able to uh, have the bankruptcy judge rule in our favor that we are a sustainable organization and can exit Chapter 11 and get off to a new future. So those are very critical to us. Uh, the budget that you're going to be seeing in a few minutes uh, needs to be seen as a as a, a continuation of a transition to a future as an independent community critical access hospital. Um, that's that's the way that we're going to exit uh, the the bankruptcy um, process. Um, and then the last thing is that uh, uh, we've asked for a four percent rate increase uh, in our charges going forward um, into the fiscal year of 2021. So let's take a little bit of look at where we've been from financial point of view. Um, when QHR arrived on the scene, which would have been around January of 2019, um, we, we realized that if we are going to be able to keep this organization uh, in this community, providing health care and recruiting the, the uh, talented professionals that we would need, that it was going to be a multi-year turnaround effort. We weren't going to be able to do it all in one, one year. And so that's what you're looking at on these slides. That's why I go back to 2018 fiscal year as, a, as our foundation. Um, I don't wanna walk you through every one of these individual um, columns, but what you're looking at is the 2018 actual, the 2019 actual, which we just got uh, the audit in uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, what we had submitted to this organization, the Greenmont Care Board, as a budget for 2020, uh, where we stand as of June 30th, because when we put the budget together, that was the latest actual information that we had, what we projected uh, for ending this particular year, and then what we're submitting as a budget. Um, 
you can see just across the page, uh, we've slowly been climbing, trying to climb back to the total operating revenue. Um, we're not going to quite, we're not going to reach it uh, in the year 2021 yet. Um, the next line down or row down, you can see is the operating expenses. Um, we've gone from 61, almost $62 million of operating expense in 2018. Uh, we believe we we're down to about 53 million. We're actually we believe we're going to end the year uh, 2020 at 51 million. So we've got a, almost a nine million dollar reduction. And a couple of slides in the future slides that will show you uh, indicate how we're we've taken those uh, expenses out of the organization. Uh, the major reasons or uh, causes to that. Uh, you can see that then our operating income uh, about. $7 million loss in 2018, continued in the fiscal year 2019, mainly because we didn't get our ability to, to put some of our initiatives to reduce cost uh, in uh, quick enough uh, to have any effect on the 2019 results. So we had about another $8 million loss. Um, we have brought that down. If you go over to the column, it says projected. We think we're gonna end this year at about a $3.6 million loss. Uh, and we think in the budget that we can get to about a break even at $185,000 positive. Um, and you see the uh, adjusted admissions um, at the bottom of the page and how the volumes have um, declined to some degree. And what we think it's leveled off in 2021 and we'll be climbing back up again. So what has changed? Uh, about a million and a half reduction in uh, revenues from the 2018 period. Um, our inpatient acute census volumes have gone down uh, 16.2 in fiscal year 18 and 19, down about 13.6 in the year 20. Uh, we're projecting that we'll be at about 13.2 uh, in the budget year. Um, in May of 2019, we closed the labor and delivery uh, service here. Uh, that removed a significant amount of revenue as well as cost. Uh, it actually was um, costing us more money to operate that unit uh, than we were bringing in in revenue. We were doing around 100 deliveries a year. Um, site census is down a little bit in 7.4, um, but we're projecting it to be about 7.3, and we'll talk a little bit more about the distinct uh, part site unit in, uh, in future slides. Uh, surgical cases have dropped uh, somewhat, but we're rebuilding the surgical uh, program. We uh, have recruited a second physician, uh, surgeon, uh, to start in the fall of uh, this year, 2020. And then the other two major pieces to the revenues going down, um, but it does improve the operating margin. And that is we changed our billing arrangement with a new provider in the emergency department. Um, in the past, the hospital would bill for both professional and technical component. The new arrangement that was put into place um, in early uh, calendar year 2019 um, was that um, the provider bills uh, for the professional component, uh, and we only bill for the technical component. Uh, and then we only uh, provide the uh, emergency room provider um, uh, a dollar amount that was significantly less than what it was costing us to. to uh, pay for those providers in the past. Uh, the same type of arrangement we changed in the anesthesia services area. Uh, brought in a new provider in fiscal year 2020 who uh, does their billing for the anesthesia professional component. So we only bill for the technical component now. Um, what has changed on the operating expenses over that period of time from 2018 to 2021? Uh, and you can see uh, here's the almost $9 million major components to that. Uh, the childbirth center uh, reduced expenses by $860,000. Uh, we've done some changes in the laboratory, restructured some things there, been able to save about $440,000 in our laboratory. Uh, our emergency room benefits, I'm sorry, emergency, our employee benefits, um, we took a look at the entire uh, benefit program, the benefit structure. Um, and through our consultant at the Richmond Group, uh, we've been able to restructure that health insurance for our employees uh, without a significant change to the employees. 
we've been able to reduce about $1.9 million um, over that period of time from 2018 to, to 2021. Uh, our emergency uh, department change that I just referred to earlier, about a million six reduction in expenses. Um, hospitalist program, uh, we're looking at changing the hospitalist program in the year 2021 uh, to uh, using the same provider we use at the for the emergency department. So we're um, doing better collaboration. We're going to save about a million dollars um, with that hospitalist program change. Uh, the reduction in anesthesia cost by 635,000. Uh, we've really worked hard at trying to reduce our travelers and locum expenses. Um, in 2018 and prior, uh, the hospital was relying a lot on uh, locums and travelers. Um, I think we've been able to benefit from the fact that this organization came right up to the edge um, of falling off. Uh, and so our staff are very focused, that have stayed with us, are very focused on um, this organization and doing what it, this organization needs to get done. So we've been able to get people to do a lot uh, that we weren't able to before. And so our need for locums and, and travelers have been significantly reduced. Um, we've done some restructuring in the management uh, side of things. Uh, uh, we've removed some, some uh, vice presidents. We've uh, changed some directors and asked people to do a lot more uh, than what they were doing in the past. And, and that's going to be, that's a, I got a typo there. I needed another zero. That's about a million $35,000 in savings over that period of time. Physician fees, we've been able to reduce a little bit, and pharmaceuticals, we've been able to uh, find some ways to, to reduce the drug cost. Um, so that's the period of time that we're looking at um, as a transition. Um, I'm going to ask Alan now to talk a little about the next slide, which tries to give you some insight into the what we believe to be the financial impact of of COVID on the organization. Um, so Alan, would you pick the next few slides up? Sure, Mike. Uh, thank you. Um, you might want to mute this because we've got an echo. All right, let me see how I do that. OK, I think that's better. Can everyone hear me? Yes, we can. OK, great. <clears throat> Just can't hear myself. Um, first of all, thank you all for introducing yourself. And uh, it's hard to believe, uh, Kevin, in a, in a couple of weeks I've been here a year. So we have uh, we want to talk about uh, the 2020 uh, financial impacts um, and some of the changes you know, that we've made and some of the, the things that have affected operations uh if you look at the this this slide what we're d trying to show here is the first column is october 19th through february 20th and that's that's what we'd call the pre-covid period and then from march to june actual that's our, our our covid which we're still actually in july through september uh that's the projected uh end of fiscal year 20. And then we're going to look at October through February, which is pre-COVID per day cost or revenue, and then uh, COVID period per day. And then we'll look at uh, what do we look like uh, for the forecast for the rest of the, the year, July through September per day. So when we look at gross, uh, gross patient revenue going across in uh, the, the first pre COVID period, we were running about 44 million. And as you can see, um, jumping over to the per day is about 290. But during the March and June period, it dropped down to 213. Um, obviously, uh, everyone knows about the COVID-19 effect and it's really hit uh, hospitals and our hospitals pretty hard with with the effect with its have on revenue. Um, when we look at deductions for revenue, those are pretty much in, in line 
uh, what we experience. Not a lot of change in, in what we expect from uh, from contractuals. Um, want to look at net patient revenue. Um, we're running along in uh, the first several months pre-COVID, and we're at 19.8. And then, as you can see, um, the last part of the year, it, 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 it jumps down to 10.6. So that's July, August, September. Um, we're, we're, we're still right around the same net patient revenue. But if you look at the per day during the March and June period, we dropped all the way down to 85,000 per day. So again, I you know, it sounds like a broken record, but COVID has really affected us uh, tremendously. Um, when we look at outpatient revenue, um, I'm sorry, uh, I jumped a little bit there. Uh, other patient, re other operating revenue. We notice as uh, we go through the period that the March through June period is 5.9 million. Well, that represents the CARES Act and COVID money that we received. So normally we run about 5,000 per day and, and that allowed us to have about 49,000 today um, to keep us in line. And you can kind of see that uh, illustrated when you look at the total operating revenue uh, during the, the period of October through February per day, it's 135. And during the COVID period, it's 134. So those monies actually helped us sustain the same level of operating income. And as you look during the period of July through September per day for total uh, operating revenue, um, it's, it's down. And we don't know yet from Congress if, if there's will be another uh, stimulus act. We don't know if we'll get more COVID money, but we do know that there is a real impact with volume. So that's that's kind of illustrated. I also want to point out um, in, in the expenses, as we go across, you can see in the pre-COVID period, uh, it's 146,000. And during the COVID period, we actually had about 154,000 of expenses related to salaries and um, employees that had COVID related expenses. But during that period, uh, we took initiatives um, to have cutbacks, furloughs, and other um, permanent layoffs to in, in order to uh, withstand that uh, large downturn of, of revenue. And you'll see that in the uh, 146,000 per day pre-COVID and then the 130. And then now that those employees are all back up and working and uh, the furloughs over, you'll see it, it jumps back to about 145. So that was necessary to make it through that period. And um, as we look at EBITDA, basically that's the earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization for those who don't know what that acronym means. Um, we, we see that, uh, Mike, could you just move the slide up just a little bit for me? Because it, I, 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 it's blocking. Is your bar blocking it, Alan? Yeah, my bar is blocking my numbers. So if you go to uh, the side of the screen into the black and click there, your bar should disappear. Okay. Okay. Well, I, I, I have paper so I can look at the paper. But what I wanted to point out is is the pre-COVID EBITDA is uh, a negative 660000 worth of cash you were generating. And if you look during the period of the COVID, we actually were, were generating some positive evidence. So it was very helpful for those stimulus monies to come in to help us. And we're projecting uh, 1.8 million, 1.9 million um, impact on cash. So, uh, and those are very unknown territories. We were un we really don't know what's going to affect uh, how that's going to affect this, but we do know uh, what, what things are, are, how they're running currently. It has a, a huge impact. So 
right now with no COVID monies in mind, um, that's kind of our, pro that's our projections for the rest of the year. And Mike, if you want to move on to the next slide, we can talk about some of the current volumes. There we go. So when we look at our uh, acute missions, um, and first of all, I want to go over the headings before, because these headings are just slightly different. So we're looking at 2019 fiscal year, 2019 actual, and then we're going to look at that pre-COVID period, and then we're going to look at the March through September, which I would call the COVID through the end of the fiscal year, and then look at the, what we have projected for the full 2020 compared to the budget for 2020, and then the 2021 budget that we're presenting. And one of the things that uh, that I that I wanted to point out is is if you notice that the 2000 the 2021, although less than the budget, it's more than the projected. And and the reason I want to point that out is in, in most cases. Uh, 2020, um, although it, the, the, the budget that was uh, presented, uh, we didn't meet it, mostly because of COVID, we also are planning in 2021 to have a point, I think it's 0.5, Mike, uh, uh, and jump in any time, Mike, that you want to help, but increase in, in some of the volumes of patient volume. So when we look at acute emissions going across, we look at 2020 projected, um, we're at 827. So that's significantly down from the budget of 1,140. But notice in 2021, we have a slight increase from what actually we had in 2020. Um, acute patient days, I want to talk just briefly about acute patient days because um, due to COVID, um, our length of stay was up and our patient days uh, would be up. And we had patients that if they had COVID or if they, if, if they hadn't been tested and got the results back, they were not able to be discharged. So our length of stay caused our acute patient days to be a little bit more. So if you see in 2020, that's a little bit of an anomaly of the other line items. You have more in the projected in 2020 than what we actually budgeted. But then we bring it back in line to 2021 budget to what it normally should be. Um, when we jump down to the psych admissions, um, our psych admissions are down um, mainly because the state of Vermont has decided to designate our uh, Wyndham Center, Psych Center, as a COVID level one psych center. So during construction, uh, we haven't had any uh, psych ad, uh, admissions or, or, or psych patient days for that matter. So, but this, uh, we do have an agreement with the state to cover our costs during that period. But you'll see those. 2020 psych days and emissions down from the actual 20 budget, but they come back up in 2021. Um, as Mike alluded to uh, earlier on the ED visits, 2020 budget is uh, 14,700. Um, we did have a much, much uh, less uh, activity in 2020, but then we expect in 2021 to start to regain some of that volume in some of those cases, uh, ED cases um, in 2020 with people coming back to the hospital, uh, not afraid of COVID anymore. Surgical cases, uh, pretty much the same issue. We're starting to see a pickup. We, we're going to miss the mark for 2020, um, and but we've put a factor in for 2021 budget for make to make those um, projections. Mike, if you want to go to the next slide, we'll talk about um, financial results and what they're trending. One more, there we go. 
So in this slide, we want to look at our fiscal year uh, 2019. Uh, look at the October through February, which is we talked about is the pre-COVID. And then we want to look at the COVID to projected to the end of the year, that period. Um, projected for the fiscal year 2020 and budget for 2020 compared to the budget of 2021. So as we go across and we look at gross price of revenue, um, in there we have uh, the price increase um, from the actual prices for 21-21 budget. Uh, deductions, um, we don't expect to have a much change to that. We are critical access, so we're cost reimbursed. So it's a very complex uh, calculation to come up with those deduction numbers. And those are the best estimates that we have at this point. Um, net patient revenue. Um, as a slide earlier, you notice that projected in 2020, we have uh, less than what we budgeted, but we're going to make that up in 2021. So again, due to COVID, we didn't make the budget, but we, uh, we have an uh, uh, uptick in 2021 to make that. Um, if you go down, and look, as I mentioned a um, little earlier on operating um, revenue, we had uh, the, the COVID money that helped us um, during that period. You'll see the, the projected period through March through September, we actually had operating income of a positive. And that is due largely to the, the CARES Act COVID money that we received. I want to jump down to EBITDA. Um, and as Mike alluded to, and I mentioned just briefly, you notice that the EBITDA in fiscal year 2019 is a negative 6.1 million. As you go across and you look during the the period, uh, obviously the COVID period, it was a positive 1.4, but all the way across, and, and I'm jumping all the way to the 2021 budget, uh, we went from taking the organization to having a negative $6 million EBITDA to generating $2.2 million in EBITDA. That's a huge turnaround, and as Mike uh, had alluded to uh, in his presentation earlier, with all of the initiatives that we've taken uh, that we put in place over the last year um that has allowed us to do that and i don't want to go down a rabbit hole but a critical access hospital it's very difficult for them to turn around that quickly because because of the way we're cost reimbursed but we've been man we've been uh managed to do that and uh 2021 looks very uh very promising um mike if you don't have anything to add you can um you can take over uh, on the trending assumptions. Okay, uh, thanks, Alan. And hopefully everybody can hear me and that I'm just not talking to myself here. Um, but the, the slide on the trending uh, revenue assumptions, um, that just recaps some of the major uh, assumptions that we have. Um, you know, the, the, the revenue for the organization, this organization anyway, and for most organizations, it is really going to be dependent on a lot of factors that we don't have a lot of control over. Um, we're assuming that our inpatient admissions are going to return to pre-COVID levels, uh, plus a half a percent, starting in the budget year of October 1. Uh, who knows? Um, I don't, and, and I've been in this business for over four decades. Um, I, I just, I have no real way to be able to predict that. Um, so that that's a tough assumption. If it doesn't happen, you know we've we've got some decisions that we have to make. Our acute length of stay, um, we're assuming is going to get back into the normal range of of below four uh, for a critical access hospital. Um, part of that is going to result from the fact that we're going to have a new um, group of folks uh, performing our hospital services. It's going to be coordinated with our emergency department much better than it's ever been. So that'll make it easier for the patient to transition when the patient has to go from our emergency room into an inpatient bed. 
um, to have the, the, the same firm with the same uh, um, objectives uh, and the same philosophies um, to be able to move those patients in. So we think we can uh, really impact that length of stay and get it in line. Um, the psychiatric admissions, um, we're predicting that it's going to return to, again to pre-COVID levels uh, with, a, with a half a percent increase in, in terms of volumes. Um, again, no way to predict what will happen with the patients um, when we reopen that distinct unit. Um, hopefully that reopening will occur in early September. It'll be dedicated solely uh, for patients who need inpatient psychiatric care who have a, a positive result for COVID-19 test. Um, we don't know how many of those patients we're going to have um, from September when we reopen uh, until the end of December. Um, that's the arrangement we have with the state um, to, to isolate those patients in that facility uh, should they occur. Um, the arrangement we have with the state uh, pays us our cost. Um, so if we have one patient um, or we have 10 patients, um, we're going to get our cost recovered at least for the period through the end of December. Um, the emergency department we already talked about uh, in terms of getting back to a kind of a pre-COVID level. We're seeing that historically for the last four months, the visits in the ED have increased about three visits per day. Um, so we think we're going to be back into that level of about 37.6 um, for the year, fiscal year 2021. Uh, surgical cases I already talked a little bit about. Uh, it was impacted by COVID, obviously, because we, we had to shut down a lot of our elective surgery uh, during that period of time. Now we've, we're reopening it, but we're doing it very cautiously, we're making sure that we're uh, protecting the safety of our staff um, as well as the safety of the patients when they come in. So we can't today quite do the same level of um, surgeries uh, that we'd like to uh, or that we can. Um, but we want to, again, uh, safety is the number one issue. But we believe that uh, effective October 2020, um, things will start getting back to normal. And then we have a 4% rate increase. So much of the revenue that, that Alan just uh, walked you through um, is all based on those kinds of assumptions. Now, the next few slides, and that's where we're going to be wrapping things up, um, is in the areas that we do have a fair amount of control over as a uh, organization and, and as a um, management team. Um, so I want to probably painstakingly take you through um, the changes in expenses uh, that we've had uh, so that you understand what some of the major changes are and why we think we can hit a target of $53 million dollars in operating expenses um, when our operating expenses as recently as the fiscal year ending September of 2019 uh, was at 58 million or how we think we're going to reduce by $5 million um, our operating expenses. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to take you through the next few slides that will focus in on the major categories um, that you see on this slide of salaries, uh, you know, going down slightly from the 2019 levels. Um, employee benefits going down about a million two. Uh, physician fees um, down a million seven from the 2019 levels. Um, medical supplies and pharmaceuticals down slightly uh, and so forth. Uh, I'm going to, the next few slides are going to do a comparison. Between, Mike, can you go back one slide for a second? Uh, let me see if I can do that, Kevin. Is that it? Yeah, where where would uh, Blue Water fall into your category? How are you uh, listing them on this? Um, they would be under uh, management and contract fees. Okay. Great, thank you. Yep. Um, so let's walk through, and I'll try to do this quickly because you can read it as well as I can. But um, salaries, uh, we did a comparison between the projected where we think we're going to end this year to what we told you a year ago we thought our budget number would be. Um, and we're about a million eight less 
in salaries. And those are the major categories or, or causes for that. Um, we, we instituted some changes in our clerical positions. We combined some folks. We um, changed uh, responsibilities of some folks. And so we got about a $240,000 savings there. Now, some of this um, is a result of, of COVID. And you're going to see where some of it comes back in the year 2021. But, but some of those savings occurred as a result of, of COVID if we had to furlough people um, or reduce their hours. Um, we had some reduced staffing in laboratory uh, for about $780,000. We really restructured our, our laboratory. Um, we've got assistance from the Dartmouth organization and a part-time manager who has, who has been outstanding and helped us uh, handle how we can do our laboratory uh, more effective and efficiently. Uh, uh, physical therapy, pharmacy, respiratory therapy, a uh, number of changes in, in that area uh, that produced some savings. Um, we had some temporary reductions for surgery staffing. Um, that's during that period of COVID. That's a COVID uh, impact. Um, obviously, if we weren't doing the elective surgeries, uh, we were asking people to, to take time off um, or reduce their hours. Um, so you'll see some of that come back. Uh, in section B here. Um, savings in the non-patient service areas, uh, housekeeping, dietary, those kinds of places, uh, and psychiatry. Uh, we did a reclass there. That's that's a simple moving the cost of the psychiatrist from salaries. You'll see that come back in. Um, I think it's under physician fees. Um, so those are the major categories uh, for the reduction of a million eight. Now we take a look at how is the budget 21 compared to the projected 2020 from where we're experiencing now. And you'll see a million three of the million eight come back uh, in some uh, form or another. Um, wage adjustments, uh, we're trying to provide some dollars for wage adjustments. This organization has not done any significant uh, adjustment to market uh, for their general uh, employees uh, for a number of years because of the financial situation that it was in. Uh, we believe that to be a sustainable organization going forward uh, and to be able to attract the staff that we need to attract, we've got to provide some dollars. So we're putting about $700,000 on top of what we uh, see the 2020 uh, numbers, to, uh, wages to be, uh, to provide that. Um, and then you see the $450,000 associated with adjusted staffing due to the COVID. Um, so the numbers that we're in Section A. Uh, some of that money has got to be put back in, assuming that we're going to be at pre-COVID uh, levels for our activities. Employee benefits. Um, we were able to reduce below the budget by eight hundred thousand um, uh, dollars. We didn't know exactly how we were going to restructure when we put the budget together a year ago. Our uh, employee benefit program. Um, we did restructure, used uh, the Richards Group, um, and were able uh, to, we believe, to bring in our uh, employee uh, health insurance uh, is the majority of that, about 600, a little over $600,000 less than what we had put in the budget last year. Um, and because of the reduced salaries, the million eight above, uh, we've had uh, you know $140,000 of reduced taxes. Uh, for those lower salaries. Um, so those two numbers are driving the $800,000 uh, performance in 2020 to the budget. Um, when we look at now the uh, 2021 budget compared to where, where we've been for 2020, uh, we're going to see an increase um, of cost in that area. Um, we have inflation on health insurance. We've got to we're a self-insured program, um, so we've got to be careful about uh, if we've had some people um, on furloughs and so forth that haven't used their health insurance, now start using it. We're providing about $300,000, a little over $300,000 for that kind of a increase. Um, uh, we have a defined pension program um, that for a number of years, we were kind of on a I'll call it a, a contribution uh, holiday. Uh, our our uh, investments were 
running pretty close to what our liability was, but because of of some efforts or not efforts, but some actual things occurring in the stock market, um, we've been told that we'll have a contribution next year of over six hundred thousand dollars. So we're providing that as an increase, um, and then in order to tr continue to to manage our cost, um, we announced in January. Uh, of 2020 that we were going to reduce, um, eliminate basically our 401k uh, pension match. Um, and, and so we don't contribute to that anymore at this moment in time. That's a, a temporary thing, but that has a $200,000 impact on 2021 budget. Um, further reduction because it went into effect in January of 2020. So we'll have it in effect for the full year in 2021. Um, I think I want enough that I just, yeah. Physician fees, um, when you, again, comparing the projected to the, to what we told the board a year ago, we got about a, about a million eight reduction in, in that area. Um, I'm sorry, increase. I wish it were a reduction increase of a million eight in the cost over what we said. Um, that's that psychiatric reclass, that first one to 250. So it came out of salaries and went in over here. Um, surgery locums, uh, we, we had to um, make a decision that we have two general surgeons full-time. Um, we made the decision in the year 2020, fiscal year 2020, that one of our physicians um, shouldn't be um, doing that anymore. Uh, and so we had to immediately start recruiting uh, and we had to we couldn't operate with just one general surgeon uh, he couldn't be on 24 hours a day seven days a week so we had to look to a locum unfortunately and there that's the cost uh, of having that locum around for that period of time in the fiscal year 2020 uh, about five hundred eighty thousand um, dollars and then the the third bullet under a there um, is <laughs> is um, something that I, I, I'm sorry I have to uh, list um, because it was a, a real miss on in the year when we put the 2020 budget together. Uh, we had two clinics, uh, urology clinic and the GYN clinic that were operated as uh, FQHC uh, organizations but uh, uh, and, and generated uh, expenses for the FQHC. Uh, as well as a little bit of revenue, but a lot of the surgical revenue from those two clinics were recorded as hospital revenue. Well, we made the decision in fiscal just before fiscal year 2020 started. That's why I didn't get into the budget that those services really belonged in the hospital. It really didn't belong over at FQAC since most of the revenue was in the hospital. So we reallocated those two. Uh, services over to the hospital. Uh, we did that right before the budget, so it didn't get into the budget for last year. Um, that's about nine hundred sixty thousand dollars of expense um, that comes over, uh, but it matches up better with the revenues uh, that we had uh, always had at the hospital side. The um, comparison then of um, the budget to where we've been historically in 2020 or where we predict 2020 to end up. Uh, has a reduction in physician fees of about $665,000 made up of those items. So we we believe we've recruited a full-time surgeon. Uh, he hasn't started yet. He's in the process of being credentialed. Uh, and uh, hopefully if we have a um, uh, positive result out of that, um, we'll have um, be able to reduce the amount of local coverage for both the general and the orthopedic uh, areas. Um, we have also some uh, specialty clinics, primarily the urology and GYN. We're restructuring a little bit in terms of their coverage and needed coverage, and so we can reduce some of the local costs there. Um, and then the reduced hospitalist coverage when we change, and that change will occur in November of 2020, where we use uh, the Blue Water organization to provide not only emergency room doctors, but a hospital do hospitalist doctors. Um, there's a, a economy of scale there in terms of the way we staff. Uh, and so that'll produce a $120,000 uh, reduction in our hospitalist cost over what we 
our experience in so far this year for the year 2021. Medical supplies and pharmaceuticals, um, we're, we're coming in about $724,000 under uh, the budget, what we thought. Some of that is volume related. Our volumes aren't at the level that we, we thought they were uh, for the budget. And Alan talked a little bit about that. So that's the primary reason why pharmaceutical pharmaceuticals and supply costs are, are under for this year's uh, for the budget. Next year, we're just, uh, it's an increase of 320,000 based primarily on inflation uh, that we're using for two and a half percent and a little bit of increased patient activities that we saw on the earlier slides. Um, management and contracted services. Um, here's where we get the impact of the new emergency room uh, providers, the Blue Water, uh, Kevin, that question that you had asked. Um, in the year 2020 uh, budget, when we put it all together, um, it turned out that because of the of the transition from our former um, providers for in the emergency room to the blue water uh, arrangement, uh, it ended up costing us about $100,000 more for some of the coverage that we had to have during that transition period. Uh, so that's that's contributing to the 615. Uh, negative uh, variance from budget. Um, we also uh, have brought on that new anesthesia group um, and we had to use some locums. Uh, uh, the arrangement that we had with that organization uh, and, and almost every organization that, that does this at hospitals um, has the same kind of arrangement and that is during that transition period, if we're having trouble or they're having trouble basically recruiting um, providers uh, and they have to use locums. Um, the premium cost of bringing that locum in is the hospital's responsibility. Uh, and so we had that occur as we changed over the anesthesia group. Um, and that's what drove that 200,000 uh, there. Um, and then 125 for accounting and some legal fees. Uh, that were higher than what we had estimated in the budget that we're experiencing this year. Um, those are not those legal fees are not necessarily the, the, the bankruptcy fees. They come in under other expenses. Uh, they're just pure legal fees or um, audit auditor fees <clears throat> that are in the management and contract service area. Um, when comparing the now projected to the budget, uh, uh, the, the two major, it, it's pretty flat uh, from 20 to 21, but there are two things going on inside uh, that that uh, same number. And, and uh, we are anticipating that the organization will come out of bankruptcy uh, by around the first of the calendar year uh, and that the organization will need the quorum um, consulting group uh, at least through a transition period to, to new leadership so that potentially the organization would not have a cost to the have quorum uh, fees beyond April 1st. So that's what's anticipated in the 2021 budget. Uh, and then there's some inflation on just some existing contractual arrangements that will occur that kind of offset that reduction. Under other expenses, um, uh, comparing to the budget again, uh, we've had an increase. Uh, we're, we're coming in about a million and a half more. Um, I think hopefully you'll remember um, that we reported in the budget last year that we had no solid way to anticipate what the bankruptcy fees were going to be, uh, both court and, and legal fees. Um, we now know we're about $850,000 of expense in the year fiscal year 2020. So that was not in the budget and therefore it's a negative variance. We also missed having the AC, ACO fees uh, in the budget for the Medicaid and Blue Cross programs. <clears throat> we, uh, we dropped out of uh, ACO for Medicare uh, January 1 of 2020. Uh, we just missed putting it in the budget, uh, the cost for that. And then we had some major repairs on some equipment that exceeded what we thought the budget was going to be for the year of 2020. So that's causing the 135. When we compare it to the um, budget to the projected numbers, 
uh, we think we can reduce. Uh, we're taking a good portion, but not all of the bankruptcy cost out because we will have some bankruptcy costs from October, probably through uh, February or March uh, before that'll drop off. So we got, a, we think we can have a savings of about 345. I think that's pretty conservative. Uh, and then we just have some miscellaneous items uh, that we're going to be able to reduce in the other expense category. So I think uh, the one last comment that I want to make um, after expenses is just the one care we we uh, referenced that that um, uh, the FQHC and the hospital had fully participated in one care in the years of 2018 and 2019. Um, we as an organization, obviously, uh, both organizations uh, believe in the objectives, but we still don't feel uh, even in the year 2021 that for financial reasons um, we're able to um, jump back in for the Medicare program. We'll continue to participate for Medicaid and Blue Cross uh, in the hopes that in 2022, if the organization um, is out of bankruptcy, is, is performing well, and stable that we could get back into that uh, ACO program for the for Medicare. So my concluding comments um, uh, are that uh, one, this is one of the most unique years in my career in healthcare. And like I've said earlier, I'm over 40 decades in healthcare in trying to do a budget uh, for two major reasons. Um, the pandemic, it, it just I don't know how to try to estimate the impact of the pandemic on volumes and on staffing. Um, we're dealing right now, and I, the whole state is dealing with, the whole country is dealing with the, the challenge of what happens if the schools don't go back in and staff have to find ways um, to care for their, their student aged children um, at home. And we've already had people coming to us saying, you know, I, I'm just not going to be able to work full time. Um, how are we going to handle that? What's that going to do to our expenses? Where will we find the staff, uh, even if the volumes do come back? How do we do that? Uh, so that's been a real challenge and a best guess from my perspective. Um, uh, I think the brightest minds are trying to work on that and come up with an answer. And I don't, haven't heard any that I can rely on. And then the other element for our organization that's probably unique in the state of Vermont, thank God, is that we're dealing with the bankruptcy process. Um, we don't know how much of a level amount of debt we're going to have to carry coming out of that bankruptcy process. Uh, we have an idea of how much and what's been built into the 2021 budget is how much we think the hospital financially can sustain in the level of debt. I mean, we entered this just as a refresher. We entered um, bankruptcy back in June of uh, 2019 um, with over $4 million of, of debt we owed CMS, uh, over $9 million of debt we owed Berkshire Bank, and over $7 million of, of debt we owed accounts payable, trend, uh, vendor uh, trade amounts. Um, so that was a significant amount of debt that we entered. Uh, we are not going to be able to come out paying everybody all of that um, and still be sustainable. Uh, how much we're still working on, um, it has to be resolved before we, uh, to the greater extent, before we submit our exit plan to the bankruptcy judge, because she's going to want to know how much we think we can afford uh, to pay. Uh, we know it. It's been built into this budget. Um, but whether we come out with that answer or we come out with a different answer uh, is going to have an impact on, on what we're budgeting. Um, so that's the other wild card for us uh, in trying to put this budget together. So um, so uh, the last thing is, uh, and I said it last year, and, and I thank the community uh, for its support last year. We're going to need to continue to have that support of the community. Um, I believe, and I think a lot of us here at the hospital believe that um, uh, if we're successful at exiting bankruptcy, and I believe we can be, uh, with the level of debt that we can afford to handle, 
um, that that's going to be a big confidence builder for us in this community. People will see that we are going to be staying around and that they should come here for their health care needs uh, and not look elsewhere um, because we are going to be here. I think the, uh, the latter part of calendar year 2019 and even to some degree into the early part of 2020 calendar year, um, there was some doubt by the community as to whether we were going to continue and therefore they may have looked elsewhere. Um, we need that community support to, to be successful going forward. So with that, uh, Kevin, that's, that concludes Alan and I's presentation and, and would um, stand ready. I don't know how good we'll be at answering your questions, but we stand ready to answer the board's questions. And let me so, see if so I can get this off the screen. Thank you, Thank Mike. You, Mike. Thank you, Alan. Um, we're going to start the board questioning with uh, member Yusufer, Maureen. Uh, sure, thanks. Um, first, thank you for your presentation and glad to see you guys are here once again in another year and that, that Springfield is trying to work its way out of this bankruptcy. Um, one of the questions I have for you is, you know, you, you've gone through a lot to look at expense cuts and, you know, efficiencies um, in the Springfield budget. And, you know, we have other hospitals in Vermont that are losing money as well. And um, one of the things I'm always pushing is cost savings and efficiencies. So, you know, can you give us some specific examples of what you think maybe some of the other hospitals should be looking at or hospitals in general to try to improve cost and efficiencies, you know, in this, um, in this system in Vermont? Uh, board member, uh, I, boy, I, I wish I could give you um, a cookie cutter approach. Uh, I, I think, and, and I spend a fair amount of time and have over the last several months uh, on calls with the other 13 CEOs along with Jeff Tiemann, um, who leads us uh, through a lot of the efforts that we've been doing with COVID uh, and trying to prepare our organizations to, to respond to that pandemic. So um, I have the highest regard for the other 13 CEOs. Um, I, 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 it would be inappropriate for me to try to, to tell, tell you that here's the cookbook that they ought to be following. Uh, it is, it's hard work. Um, it takes detail effort. I believe every one of those other 13 CEOs are trying to do the same thing. Um, what we just, what I mean, the, the try to answer your question was some more than just fluff, uh, which I think that earlier comment was to some degree. Uh, uh, is that, you know, we just, we have a senior team um, who um, really doesn't assume that everything should be the way it is um, and and ask the, the questions all the time. Why do we do it that way? Is there a better way to do it? Um, and and so, I, you know, I think where we were, where we found ourselves uh, as an organization back in um, December of 2018 is actually when it first, uh, as I understand it, first really surfaced. Um, <clears throat> was a certain wake-up call for the entire senior management team that we have to do something different. Um, I hate to use that trait comment that to keep doing the same thing over and over and expect a different outcome um, is a definition of insanity. So the only thing that I can tell you we really did is we just peeled everything back and took a look at everything and said, how can we do this different? Um, the decision on changing the emergency room providers was made before I came on the scene. It was the right decision. Um, that certainly has helped us, both in the emergency room in terms of the quality of care that's being provided in the emergency room, um, as well as the coordination within the department within the departments uh, of the hospital. Uh, I believe the same result is going to happen with the hospitals uh, by bringing the hospitals under the purview of the blue water organization. Um, so I, I wish I could tell you, you know, you look at this, 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 and you're, you're golden. It, you, you just have to peek, you have to peek under the sheets of everything and nothing is sacred. Thank you. 
Yeah. No, and I too respect you know all the other CEOs and what the other hospitals are doing. Um, what we do see is though in times of crisis that you know when when hospitals when you're forced to make the changes that you needed to, um, you were able to do some some pretty dramatic things in order to cut costs to be there. And and that's really you know at the end of the day is trying to make sure the other hospitals will be here. Um, and many of them are are losing money, and we don't want to run into this situation. But uh, thank you. Um, can you talk a little bit about the COVID money that you received, um, and if you are requesting anything out of the two hundred seventy five million um, current ask, um, and really talk about it in context of where your cash flow is and what concerns you have, if any, of, of the cash flow needs you're going to have in 2021? Because obviously, like we know, cash is king. And uh, mm -hmm. you know, you didn't really talk much about cash flow in your presentation or at all. And, th and that's been one of the driving issues of, of going into bankruptcy, et cetera. So can you talk, talk about that and make us feel comfortable that you're going to be, you have enough cash to survive? Well, let me try to answer your question initially, and then obviously with Alan and the CFO, he can he can add in because he he is with it all the time. But we're we are not only required, but for bankruptcy purposes, but we're required under quorum practices, quorum health resource practices, um, to produce a 13-week cash flow and update that every week. But we can tell you what our cash flow is going to be, and actually we just excuse me, updated that. Alan and his staff just updated that information through the end of this calendar year, um, assuming that that'd be about the time that if we're successful at submitting our exit plan that we'd come out. Um, so we know what our cash flow is going to be, and we manage that every day, every week. Um, uh, that is critical. Uh, again, I think the biggest difficult unknown area is is how much um, the COVID impact of the pandemic is going to have on our cash flow. Uh, we were pretty good when we started impacting our cash flows back in March with some number that we just didn't know. Uh, we've been pretty good about coming real close to that number, um, but we also are assuming that it's going to filter or peter out a little bit. If I can phrase it in that uh, term. We don't know if that's going to happen um, uh, because we're dependent on those insurance companies in a lot of cases having the staff to process the claims. Um, and if they don't process the claims, we don't get paid the remittance advice, um, no matter how good we are at billing. Um, so um, to try to be a little bit more concrete with your answer, um, we believe that we can come out of bankruptcy at the end of this calendar year with sufficient cash. It's not a great position. It's it's about 30 days cash on hand um, compared to the roughly 56 we had several weeks ago. Uh, so we are going to be depleting cash, but some of that cash is bankruptcy related expenses. Um, we believe that we can stabilize the organization at around 30 days cash on hand, um, a typical critical access hospital runs around twice that amount. So we're going to be running pretty lean. But as Alan mentioned earlier in, in his discussions around some of those slides, it's pretty difficult for a critical access hospital to accumulate cash because they're paid their cost. Uh, in in most cases with very little more than cost and it's allowable cost so a lot of times it's not the actual cost uh, and we're I think around 45 percent Medicare reimbursed so it, it's doubly hard for a critical access hospital to accumulate any cash but we think we've with the COVID money that we've received which we received about 5.4 million dollars of CARES Act money that that money has helped us get to a point can stabilize if this pandemic is what did you ask for any more money in the out of the 275 we did submit an application uh we do have expenses that we've identified but uh alan correct me if i'm wrong there was really no spot that we could see in the application that identified how much money we needed it asked for a lot of information around 
how much revenue we were generating and how much we thought was COVID related, but it didn't really ask how much we needed. We couldn't find that spot on the application. So, but we do have a dollar amount. Um, you know, it, it, it would probably be in the neighborhood of a quarter of a million dollars that we could certainly use that would help us offset some of our COVID expense monies. Yeah, yeah we've heard that as well, that it didn't necessarily have a dollar amount. I guess there's going to be some type of calculation we'll have to see. Yeah. Um, okay, the final area that I want to talk about is is your NPR. Um, many of the hospitals are expecting, you know, NPRs on par with maybe 2019. Most most of the hospitals aren't looking at levels that are going to be equal to or exceeding the pre-COVID levels. Um, and as you know, if you look at the history of Springfield, this is this is an area that's been the concern in the past, right? If if you forecast too high of an NPR number, and knowing exactly what you're saying about expenses, that expenses run very closely to NPR at, at this critical access hospital. Um, if you miss the top line, you then miss the bottom line, you know, fairly significantly. Um, and I'm having a hard time getting to the number that you have for NPR. And, and I know, you know, you guys are building it a different way, but, you know, just looking at some of the numbers that you did put in there and some of the comments that you had, um, your forecast is, is trending to about 138 uh, per day. 138,000 per day to get to your to your number. Your pre-COVID level was 130 per day, and your July through September level was 116 per day, and um, the 2019 level would be around 132 per day. So, help me get to 138 per day because I'm I'm keep coming to a number. Um, you know, you're trending at 116 per day would be about $42 million in NPR. Your, um, if, if you were, all your comments talked about, you're not necessarily going to get back to all the pre-COVID levels for surgery and some of the other areas. Um, and I know that you do have obviously a 4% increase uh, reflected. Um, in there on your top line, but as it goes down into NPR for commercial, that would only be about a million dollars. Um, so I'm struggling with getting to the to the one to the numbers that you have, and the concern about that is again, if you come in around a 48 million or or less, um, because people are wary about coming back to the hospital, you have on the added issue of um, people having thought you maybe were going to go out of business. And then on top of that, another concern is that there will be less people participating in commercial if they're moving to Medicaid or Medicare because they've lost their jobs and things like this in COVID. So, you know, all things kind of putting pressure on on the NPR. And I know you have that in the end as being a big concern, but uh, my my question is really going to be how do you get support to me that you can get to the over 50 million and two, if you can't, how are you going to be able to quickly pivot because if you were to lose an additional two or three million dollars, that could jeopardize coming out of bankruptcy. Um, board member, it, 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 it you hit on you hit on the, the the toughest line in the budget. Um, we're worried about that number too. I know that's not giving you a whole lot of comfort. Um, I, I think the one factor I can think of. Uh, that makes it a little different is uh, for us in the year 2021 is um, we've established um, the clinics that we had uh, were not classified by, by Medicare as provider based. Um, and so we've got some additional revenue that's coming from the Medicare program as having those clinics classified as provider based. That's affecting a little bit of this year, but a lot of 2021. So that's changing that ratio a little bit. I, I couldn't tell you how much and whether it makes up the whole difference. Um, but Alan, is there anything else that you can think of that is well, different for 2021? Mike, so Mike, you, 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 did, you did hit on it a little bit. So you have, um, you have, the way that critical access hospitals work, and I don't want to get too far in the weeds, but 
as as your cost increased, obviously your reimbursement increases, but uh, for Medicare and Medicaid, but that doesn't catch up for for a while. So in 2018, 2019, our costs were much higher, but our reimbursement was much less. And we we found that out when we filed our cost report for 2019 and just finalized. So, and I can tell you that outpatient was was about two percent less. So what they do is they'll settle up. We paid you 2% less this prior year. So that cash will then be generated. So your net patient revenue will be a little bit better, if you will, in the next year. So the, the trick is to try to balance that and estimate that net patient revenue. It's, it's, it's not actually, um, an, it, it's more of an art than it is a science. It's, it's, you have to, you have to kind of juggle and kind of, um, we have models, we have experts that, that look at that and try to estimate what that um, cost report settlement is. I can tell you it was very challenging. Um, I don't know if you've heard this from other, other CFOs, but the PSNRs were not correct because of the ACO program. So that delayed the, the, the filing of all the cost reports. And and what that did is it made it very difficult for critical access hospitals to try to estimate what our settlement was going to be, which affects our net patient revenue. Um, we have a better handle on it now, but our particular in our particular case, we expect to have a better um, fiscal year 21 with net patient revenue. I know that's a lot to be said to say that our cost report settlement is now more accurate more more because of the ACO um, and the PSNR is being corrected. And we're able to now actually do a better job of, of predicting that patient revenue. And in, in our case, it, it, it's it's a positive impact. OK, um, I'm going to pass it on to other board members, but I, I would just um, ask you to really be looking at what you're trending in for the for July, August, September as you exit this year. And if you trend that forward to next year, you know, assessing what that would be on, on, you know, a per day, because we are seeing in a lot of the other hospitals, unfortunately, it's just that people aren't completely coming back yet. And so to assume you might be exceeding 2019 and 2020 budget by that much, you know, we just worry more about the, you know, the whole bankruptcy. Yeah, the, the PPS hospital, a PPS hospital prospective payment system hospital, they're reimbursed based on a DRG payment for their inpatient. So they're, they're, they can really improve by reducing cost and, and, and volume. But for us, if we reduce cost, then it reduces our, our, um, yeah, it's our weird, weird so, so that's why when I said earlier, it's very difficult for a critical access hospital to actually generate a lot of cash and improve. But in our situation, because we had such high costs and we were being reimbursed less, we're going to see an improvement in the next couple of years until it levels out. And then we'll have to, our, our, our reimbursement will become less in the next couple of years. It, it's kind of like a waving, uh, you know, boat down down the, the river, the ocean, because you kind of try to get it leveled out. And, and when we have expenses leveled out and we have our volume leveled out, you'll see more of, a, of a, a level more predictable period. I know that's a lot said that it's a very it's a very difficult uh, challenge for critical access hospitals to estimate net patient revenue. And we, we, we measure that by how much cash is coming in because that basically is our cash or net patient revenue. And we, we've been able to do that pretty uh, fairly uh, accurate after we had the correct PSNRs uh, that were corrected. Um, Okay, I'm going to pass it on to other board members because I know sure. we have a lot of time constraints. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Maureen. Now we're going to move to member Holmes. Jess? You're Sorry, on mute. There you go. Yeah. Um, okay, well, thank you. And thank you for the presentation and, um, you know, for the hard work you did during COVID and also for starting to turn this hospital around like Maureen. I'm, I'm happy to see you all here this year. Um, I guess I'm going to just pick up a little bit where Maureen left off and just ask, rather than go into too much detail here, 
if you could follow up with us with a better breakdown of the NPR assumptions that are going into 2021. Um, I'm finding discrepancies in the tables, in the narrative, and in the presentation. There's inconsistencies. And I just, I'll give you one example. In the tables in the submission, the ask was for, for NPR uh, 51.5 million. Um, I think in the presentation you just had 50.6 million. Um, I, I don't know what the actual ask is. There's some, there's some inconsistencies there. I would love to see um, the associated delta on that cost report settlement. That would be really helpful for me. Like how much is that adding to NPR? Um, the volume assumptions, I'm struggling as well. When I look at um, the presentation with the adjusted admissions, for example, and maybe it's not it, it's not clear to me, but the 2019 actual adjusted admissions you have as 8,020 going down to 6,014 in the budget, that's a 25% reduction in adjusted admissions. But then in the presentation, you also talk about inpatient admissions are going to return to pre-COVID levels plus 0.5%. So I'm struggling how to reconcile a 25% reduction in adjusted admissions with a return of inpatient admissions plus 0.5%. Um, average daily census here in the presentation, I think you were talking around 13 in the narrative. It talks about it going down to 10.5 from 13 again. Another, you know, roughly 20, 25% reduction in average daily census. So again, I'm struggling with how does that reconcile with pre returning pre-COVID volumes? Again, surgical cases going in 19, actual going from, you know, over a thousand to under 900. Again, about a 25% reduction, even though you're adding another surgeon, which confuses me a little bit, um, how that would all play out. So, if you can answer that now, that's great. But if it just requires a follow-up of trying to do a, a, a matchup of what's in the narrative, what's in the tables, what's in the presentation, and how you get to that NPR number that you are submitting, that would be really helpful to me. Now, I, I think it's probably best, rather than trying to, to answer it on a fly here, um, let's let's work with the your staff and get some of the answers to the inconsistencies that you've identified. Okay, uh, that would be fantastic. I just I, don't know exactly where, what, what the ask is. Um, okay, so my second set of questions is, I, I do wanna, I'm trying to understand a little bit about um, inflation. And so, and I'm asking most of the hospitals, it's all, if not all of the hospitals this, um, it looks like you are assuming for inflation about 2.5%, right, for medical supplies and pharmaceuticals. Did you break that down separately, medical supplies separately from pharmaceuticals at all in your analysis? No, we, we didn't in this particular run on the budget. We just took the two and a half for both. Okay. Um, and the wage and salary adjustment, not uh, accounting for any uh, FTE changes, but just say for existing employees, what is the wage and salary inflationary adjustment or the cost of living include and market adjustment that you're anticipating for next year what is the percent increase the the uh way we went about doing that is we didn't necessarily um try to develop what the uh pay program would be for 2021 we just took a block of money um, the senior team right now is in the process of trying to identify what areas are market adjustments and how much would be left over then for an across the board increase so we didn't we didn't approach it by saying well we're going to have a cost of living increase of three percent and then the leftover amount is market adjustments what i'm asking the senior team to do is primarily our human resource person where are the areas of the hospital that have the furthest distance from market how much would it take to bring us somewhere close, we're not going to get up to market, but somewhere close to market. How much is that going to cost? And then what do we have left over out of the 700,000 for a cost of living? So that's okay. kind of the way we're approaching it and a little different, I think, than maybe some other folks who don't have the no. market problem issues that we have. Right. 
I'm just trying to get a little bit of a sense, but I understand you're doing it differently. So what percentage of your sort of expense budget is typically human capital or wages and salaries and compensation? Just Well, I think it's uh, 45, 50%. Yeah, it's usually about 50% in the hospital, give okay. or take, give okay. or take. Okay. Um, what, so let me just see what else. Are you assuming uh, for a rate increase for Medicaid? Yes. Is there an assumption in there for any Medicaid rate increases? But yeah, beyond the psych unit, I know you've got a separate agreement there, but right. not including your psych unit agreement. I think the way we approach it, Alan, correct me if I'm wrong, is we just took the 4% across the board. So you're assuming right. Medicaid will increase their rates 4%? Right. Okay. That would be shocking, <laughs> I think. Okay. Um, sorry. Um, well, the, my last question is around uh, COVID related expenses that are going to carry into 2021. So this would be screeners, PPE, any kind of, you know, reconfiguring of workflow, testing, anything like that. Can you, have you tried to carve that out of your budget at all? And if not, could you? We haven't. Uh tried to identify any additional expenses as a result of COVID beyond October 1. Um, we probably could. I mean, we could, I can tell you that our, through June, our payroll cost for COVID was about $155,000. Okay. So that would be the months of March through June. Um, and, and that would cover staff that we had to bring in special for setting up testing tents and yeah. all of those kinds of expenses. Uh, we could assume that uh, and we we opened our tent and then I think within about a month or so closed it um, hmm. because of the, the Department of Health said that you know they wanted to handle all of that kind of testing. We actually, I shouldn't say, the hospital closed it. The FQHC picked it up over on the FQHC side because they found it easier for the patient to be to come into the clinic where they would typically go as opposed to the parking lot of the hospital. So the hospital stopped that, but the clinic picked it up. So the clinic's got some COVID costs. Yeah, we could try to put in some assumptions and say of the 155 for the that March, April, May, June period, how much of that might carry into 2021 if, if we don't have a right, solution. Right, right. PPE expenses that you might have, you know, if not for COVID, we wouldn't have this, you know, volume of PPE orders or things like that. I'm not sure, but yep. it'd be helpful to know what what the carve out would be for 2021 of COVID related expenses. We, we could try to take a shot at putting something like that together. And, and my last question is really about just trying to understand how you see the consequences both positive and negative of the separation of the FQHC and the hospital as you exit bankruptcy? Are there, I'm sure there's pros and cons, and I'm just curious as you're trying to analyze that, how that how that looks for you in the future. Great question. I get I get quizzed like that about every, once a week from people <laughs> um, because I know Gifford is continuing to, to try with move forward with that model. I think what we found here, and, and I apologize to anybody who I might offend who was here before I got here, um, but I think it was um, too easy when the two organizations were one, it was too easy to not really try to focus on what's it, what's it costing for us to do that service. And I know that probably isn't very clear, but by separating the benefit I see and separating is twofold. Uh, one is uh, we have to look at each one of our services, the hospital does and the clinics do, and figure out can we provide that service without losing a lot of money? And if we have to lose a lot of money, you know, where do we pick it up from? Because there are services that we can't make every service make money. Um, but there are gonna be services that we can make a little bit more money to cover the ones that we don't. But by having two separate organizations looking at that individually, 
I think we do a better job of that exercise and being able to make decisions off of that. Um, the um, I just lost my thought for the other benefit. Darn it. Um, I can tell you what the disadvantage is going to be. Um, potential. And we, we're working on this every day here. And Josh Dufresne, who is the acting CEO for SMCS and therefore the FQHC, uh, he and I talk about this all the time. Um, we have to work closely together. We have to walk side by side, hip attached. Because, as I said earlier, very early in the presentation I made, um, there are primary care doctors. We can't operate without primary care doctors. Um, they potentially could refer their patients to another hospital, but it's certainly not going to be convenient for those patients. They have to go to a different hospital if they see uh, a patient um, up in Lud uh, Ludendary or out in Ludlow or you know, here, right here in Springfield, they have to refer those patients to a different hospital. So they benefit by having us around. We obviously benefit by them being around. So we do have to do things together. Um, I just remember now my second benefit. The second benefit is, and I think this is probably the one that really pushes us in this direction, is who knows what healthcare is going to be in the future. And so for the two organizations to be together, uh, limits, I think, both organizations' potential for looking at how life could be different for them. Um, that's separate. You know, we can have a future, maybe with a different partner in healthcare, in hospitals, and the FQHC can do the same thing and strengthen them, um, their own organization, by joining in with another organization. By being joined together, that limits you because of the rule that I think you all know that the hospital cannot own the FQHC. So with us being coupled together, there weren't any other hospitals that could really come in and say, we'll partner with you and make you a stronger organization because the FQHC owned us. Um, but by separating us, we've, we open up those opportunities that we didn't have as a combined organization. Great, thank you. I like the optimism. That's it for me, Kevin. Thank, thank you, Jess. Next, we're gonna to move to member lunch, Robin. Thank you. Hi, thanks so much for your presentation today. Um, I'm gonna to jump right in to keep us um, on track in terms of our time. Uh, I was interested in learning a little bit more about telehealth and, tel and your phone. Uh, increase in usage of phone around uh, and during COVID and how that went, what kind of implementation you did in that in that regard, and then what you're expecting moving forward. Most of that uh, was impacted by the FQHC, or I should say the FQHC really utilized that. At the hospital, we didn't do a lot of that. Um, we had some of that. Um, utilization was increased with our psychiatric care. Mm -hmm. uh, we were able to have patients uh, seen in our ED. Uh, I think you may or may not be aware that we worked with the state and we identified two emergency room beds that were dedicated to patients who needed psychiatric care who had a positive COVID-19 test. And our Wyndham Center wasn't open yet, which it still isn't. We have two beds in our emergency department um, that our emergency room folks can put a patient who needs those services in. And then we do a lot of telemedicine um, with that patient to our Wyndham Center staff. If the staff can't get up right away, they can at least you know, do telemedicine. So that's where we really uh, utilize telemedicine at the hospital. Um, we, uh, I think that went pretty smoothly. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there were a lot of problems with that and I think it was very beneficial uh, from the Clinic side of things, I mean, Josh Dufresne would be a much better person to answer that question, but uh, I think he he was able to get the providers uh, to, to utilize telemedicine quite a bit. And we were able to, I say we, because, you know, we do have to work together here, but I think the FQHC was, was uh, able to get a lot of their providers uh, working with telemedicine and getting their 
their patients comfortable with using telemedicine so that they got up to a significant uh, percentage of visits uh, that compared to pre-COVID. In other words, that they, you know, they, we were thinking it was only going to be about 30 or 35 percent for several months, and they were able to get up to 50 and 60 percent. Wow, know, that's great! In the months of of um, May and June, simply because they were able to use telemedicine and, and get that visit. So, yeah, I think we utilized it a fair amount, and I think we continue to utilize it. Great. Um, I was wondering, in terms of your staffing, you had mentioned that you did have some staffing reductions in particular area in your slides. I wonder if you can quantify that in FTEs just to give us a sense of. of I that. can. I can. I thought you might ask that question, so I had my human resource person um, at the hospital. Um, we had 24 um, staff members. I would have probably pretty close to 24 FTEs, I would think, which is about just under 6% of our work staff uh, were furloughed um, in the early months, uh, March, April. Um, predominance of that were the folks that were in our adult daycare program, mm. in an adult daycare program. Yeah. So I, I'd say probably a third of those people uh, were the adult daycare staff uh, who have still not uh, we still have not opened that up, but we're utilizing yeah. some of that staff in, in other places. Uh, we also had 17 staff members take reduced hours. So they, a lot of that was in our physical therapy area, obviously mm -hmm. surgery area, um, uh, because we couldn't do elective surgery. That is about 4% of our workforce at the hospital. Great. And then in terms of your planned reductions, like your clerical staff and those sorts of layoffs that you did, how many staff did you did that, that one, account for? That one, I didn't anticipate that question, so I don't have that number. Okay, um, great. But um, yeah, I don't know exactly how many. I'd, I'd have to get back to you on that one. Okay, to, thank you. Sure. Um, in terms of the travelers it, it's great to see the reduction in traveler costs i think that's been overall a concern of the board the last few years across all the hospitals um, are you expecting your travelers costs to remain at the lowered level or are you expecting that to rebound we're expecting it to rebound a little bit in 2021 i think we're budgeting a little bit more for travelers not a whole lot more but a little bit more than what we've experienced in 2020. Um, uh, Critical areas, lab, laboratory, it's hard to get lab techs um, and it's hard to get uh, uh, imaging techs. So those are probably the two key areas that we still utilize um, local travelers in those two areas. Um, not much in nursing. Um, uh, we have a marvelous vice president of patient care services and, and she has a fantastic uh, a manager who manages both the inpatient unit and the emergency department uh, and we do a lot of floating of our nurses between the emergency room and the unit and back and forth uh, and they're fully trained to do those kinds of things mm -hmm. uh, so we don't we've been able to avoid having to use a lot of travelers in the nursing area it's primarily those two ancillary departments great thank you um I just had a couple more questions. I was curious what you what assumptions you made around dish payments. If you assume that to be flat from last year, Alan, do you know? I don't know off the top of my head. I think we had a dish flat. Uh, from my recollection, it's flat. We can get back with you on that, but uh, we, we don't. Um, you know, we don't get notified, uh, and due to the COVID, uh, they're delaying on getting us our new numbers for for the year. Yeah. So. Great. Thank you. Um, and did you factor in in any way the elimination of the Medicare sequestration through the end of this calendar year, either into your 2020 budget expectations or the first quarter of 21? So, Mike, let me let me answer that one, Mike. So. Uh, 
again, as I, I said, we're critical access, so our reimbursement yeah. uh, is actually 101% of our Medicare allowable cost, and that has already been reduced by 2% of sequestration, which is um, which is settled in our cost report. So, Right, um, but it's my understanding that the feds eliminated, like took that back, like allowed you to have the 101 for 2020. So they eliminated the 2% reduction. Not for critical access that I, you know, not that I've heard. I can get back with you, but um, our cost report is settled up. And um, let me get back with you because I have not heard that that was. Uh, but but, 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 but the direct answer to your question is we did not anticipate that to go away. We assume right. that still yeah. be. Yep. Yeah. 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 I mean, it was in some of the more recent yeah. stimulus. Uh, bills. So yeah, I'm, just, I'm just trying to get a sense of what's in and what's out. Yeah, thank um, you. Yeah, thank you. Um, and then lastly, you had mentioned that some of the new protocols uh, did sort of limit your ability to get back to normal, the new COVID protocols back to normal, particularly in surgeries or whatever, which uh, the increased disinfectants, and I'm assuming you're doing screenings and those sorts of things. Um, so it sounds like you sort of assumed that as of October that 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 wouldn't have to be continued. Yep, that's what we're okay. assuming. Great. All right, I will pass it to Tom. Thank you, Robin. Tom. <clears throat> Good morning. Uh, thank you both for your your presentation and for all of your hard work uh, since you've, uh, you know, found yourself uh, heading down the bankruptcy path. Um, I was just looking in in the adaptive submission uh, that your your dish your dish expectation went up by about a hundred thousand dollars from nine hundred thousand to a million. Just, uh, um, you know, it, you know the, 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 that's what you presented us. I'd like to just in a couple of sentences echo um, <clears throat> Maureen and Jess in terms of trying to tie this NPR number. Where where I got lost was in your in your narrative. You said that the 2021 Medicare net patient revenue will equate to quote the ratio of gross revenues to total revenues in 2020, and the Medicaid and commercial have basically the same explanation as Medicare. But then when uh, turning to the um, payer mix table, uh, it shows over 2020 that Medicaid is going up 29.4% and Medicaid down 47% uh, percent from 8.8 uh, .8 million to 4.6 million. And so I'm just having a, and then uh, in previous testimony this morning, uh, talking about a 4% increase in Medicaid. So I, I you know, these top side numbers in, in, uh, are, I think, uh, do need some work. You know, so that we can understand how the your ups and downs kind of roll into you know the the, the payer buckets. Um, okay. I, I I I pushed the number on that, so my phone wouldn't answer, and here we are. Um, <clears throat> Tom, if I could just make a, a comment, you know, a couple of you have mentioned that one one of the factors that's kind of skewing that is the five and a half million dollars of care money is not in our our net patient. N number for 2020. It's actually in our other other uh, income, which goes in our total operating income. So when you're looking at 2020 and kind of comparing it to 21, you can easily see that when you look at other operating revenue is 5.9 in the period from March to June. So that's not in our net patient revenue. So if you're you're looking, how do they get, you know, from the net patient revenue numbers in 21 from 2020? That's a huge issue that normally we would that would be in net patient revenue but it's not hope that helps no yeah it, it helps um it, it does it does help i i you know a kind of a fuller explanation across all all payers sure. you know I, I i think would help a lot um i in terms of the que a question that the uh uh healthcare advocate asked um about uncompensated care um you in, in in your narrative you said that, that the hospital is engaging a new firm to follow up on claims in a timely yeah. manner and then later uh, uh, our financial assistance policy remain you you say that your financial assistance policy remained the same 
Um, and I'm just wondering what this new firm uh, uh, is doing. Well, let me let me comment on that, Mike. So, so in, in a hospital um, setting, you have what we call commercial, and we have self-pay, and, and then obviously your uh, third party, which which cover commercial and, and um, Medicare, Medicaid, and the self-pay. So, what we've done is we structured uh, the hospital to create C both to where the self-pay is focused on an outside. Uh, firm, and then we focus on the larger claims. But the staff, when we came in there, were currently were not able to. One, they weren't trained properly. They didn't have the expertise in the level to to collect and follow up on those claims. So what we saw was those claims were aging, and as we all know in the industry, the older the claim gets, the less likely they are to collect the money. So we engaged a company to come in to help get our staff trained to where we can take over um, and they've been able to maintain our cash collection levels uh, in, in our uh, business yes. office. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll call you family. 7376. There's some, some noise there. Um, I have just a couple of more questions uh, quickly. Um, one is uh, in your in, the, in your opening narrative, um, uh, you say in addition to our difficult pair mix, we have challenging demographics, economic outlook, the comparative poor health status of our residents, uh, and ever increasing uh, social challenges. Um, and I think you know we, we spend a lot of time talking about budgets, uh, kind of a tub on their own bottom. But uh, the larger context to me uh, is of significance, where in 2020, Springfield's payer mix was 18% Medicaid, 35% Medicare, and 47% commercial. And that compares to statewide averages of 11% Medicaid, 33% Medicare, and 55% commercial. And so I'm just wondering, you know, you know how much you know, dip more difficulty is your challenge to get out of bankruptcy because your underlying payer mix uh, is probably the worst in the state, um, certainly not near the average or near the best in the state, which is UVM, which is has a 55% commercial payer mix, um, a 9.9% Medicaid, and uh, a 29.7% Medicare. So I guess my, my question is, if you if you had the statewide average or the UVM payer mix, what would your life, what what, what would this budget submission look like coming out of bankruptcy? Um, it would probably look a whole lot better. Um, yeah, it, it is a challenge, uh, board member. It, it is, um, but uh, you know what? Uh, I suspect. Um, and we haven't gotten to the point where we're, we've submitted an exit plan yet, but I suspect what the judge is going to look for is in the world that we operate in, how, you know, how do we assure them, um, the bankruptcy court, that, that we can manage an organization and keep enough cash flow going so that we don't go back into bankruptcy in the next two or three years. Um, and, and so, yeah, if we had a better payer mix, it would be wonderful, but we don't. We have to manage what we got, and um, I think one of the benefits is that you know we do, we are a critical access hospital who at least can assure ourselves of getting a good portion of our cost reimbursed from Medicare. Mm -hmm. So. Um, and so my, my last quick question is, um, given the damage that COVID has done across most hospitals in terms of uh, people seeking care there, um, are, you, are you taking any um, proactive messaging uh, to try to reach out uh, to the community around you to assure them or assuage any concerns that they have about coming to the hospital for, for, you know, for health care? The 
activity that we've done to date, and matter of fact, I think I have another one scheduled for tomorrow, uh, is we use our um, our social media to try to communicate. We find that's the best. Uh, so um, I will periodically get on our website and have a, a, dis a I'll call it a discussion, but it's a one-way discussion um, about the things that we do and how we protect our staffs and how we're going to protect you as a patient when you come in and expect these things to happen. I have another one scheduled to do tomorrow. Um, that's the best way that we found the, to, to try to communicate with the people about, uh, you know, your your concern is valid, but here's what we've done to try to offset that. So. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Mike, could you update the board on where you currently stand in your ongoing saga with the PPP? <laughs> okay. Um, we filed uh, an application um, early on uh, and, and were cut off at the pass and told by the bank we had filed it with that um, because the application stated that uh, we were an organization in bankruptcy, that we couldn't um, continue the application. Um, we then um, filed uh, with the bankruptcy court uh, a uh, request for a judgment that uh, that be um, that we be allowed to apply because uh, we showed that we could use that money and we indicated how much money it was around two million a little over two million dollars for the hospital. Um, the bankruptcy court judge ruled in our favor. Um, the uh, small business administration chose to appeal that. Uh, and so that's what they did. Uh, and so it's now in an appellate court. Um, we have asked for that to be, and I'll probably get this wrong, I think it's a second district court or something, appeal court. Uh, it bypasses the first level of the appeal court goes right to the this next level uh, in order to expedite it, uh, and that's where it's at. Um, we have been. So you have no trial date or anything. We have no trial date. We we had a discussion with our bankruptcy attorneys. Um, they were aware of at least one hospital in the country who had this occur to them, and what the hospital did is they went to the bankruptcy court. They uh, asked for a dismissal of their case, which they got. They filed for their PPP money, got that approved, and then within a few weeks after getting the PPP money, re-entered a petition for bankruptcy. Oh. We chose we chose not to do that, um, thinking that it's just way too confusing for the public to understand. They would read an article that would say. Springfield dismissed their bankruptcy case. We'd have all our vendors wanting us to pay them. We wouldn't have the cash to pay them. We'd get the $2 million and then we'd go back into bankruptcy. It, it, we just thought that was kind of a awkward way to go about getting the money. So we're gonna continue to pursue um, the, the appeal. Um, we don't anticipate getting it before we exit bankruptcy. If you know if we're successful at exiting in December, we don't anticipate this case being uh, decided on before we exit. But if we could get the money after we exit, that certainly would help our our cash position. Yes, absolutely. Um, in the past, uh, we've heard a great deal about um, the substance use disorder problem in Springfield, and my question is. Um, what have you seen as a result of the um, COVID pandemic? Are you seeing an increase or a decrease in overdoses and suicides? Boy, well, Kevin, I, you know, I, I don't feel qualified to answer that question. I'd sure love to get an opportunity to talk to the folks on the front line. I have not heard them tell me that they're seeing an increase or a decrease. Uh, more than normal, but I'd like to check with them first before I gave you a, a solid answer for that. Okay. So, but I can Appreciate do that and get that out to you and the board. 
The other thing, I my last question is um, really about your contract with Blue Water, and um, you're definitely um, expanding the um, footprint that Blue Water has at Springfield. And I just want to make sure that there are terms in the contract that don't put you in a position where at some point they could come in and demand a, a large increase because they have that leverage over you. So are you confident that the contract protects you? Yes, it has a it has a um, uh, term to it. Uh, I think it's I don't have it memorized, so don't quote me on it. But I think it it runs until around the end of 2022, or early part of 2022. I'll have to check for sure. So it has a term on it. So it will end. Uh, there is the ability to early terminate the contract if necessary, and and there also is a portion that on a quarterly basis we take a look at their performance um, and how they're performing and have a conversation if they're underperforming um, to, to do what they need to do to be able to perform. And to, the, to date, there's been no issues. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, you know, I feel uh, uh, confident. There are other firms out there. Um, so it's not like they would be the only ones that we could turn to. Um, so I, I feel confident. Sounds that like things are working out pretty well, though. They are. They are. Yeah. I'm very pleased with sure that continues. <laughs> That's a good thing. <laughs> yeah, I'm. I'm impressed with the their leadership. I'm impressed with the focus that their organization has on quality. Uh, I attend every month. Where there's a um, emergency department meeting, in which you know, their medical director runs that meeting. I attend those meetings. They're about two hour long meetings on Zoom. Um, and so, no, I'm, I'm confident that uh, right now that they're performing right at the level that we need them to perform at. Um, and expanding their footprint to the hospitalist had that negative, and I recognized it, that, you know, it, it bringing them more into being dependent on them for that service. But I think the merits of doing it, which is the better coordination between our hospitalist program and our emergency department, since that is so key to us, being able to transition those people that are appropriate to stay here uh, in a smooth and, and logical fashion, outweighed the risk that we had of bringing them in to, to be a bigger piece. Okay. So at this point in the uh, hearing, we're going to turn it over to the healthcare advocate. I'm not sure I saw uh, Mike on the list. Um, Julia, are you doing the questioning today? Hi, Kevin. Yes, I'm gonna be doing the questioning for today. Great. Can everybody hear me okay? We can. Yes. Great. Um, so first, I wanted to just follow up on the question about the uh, new collection firm that you'll be working with. Uh, and I'm wondering if when you or the firm contact patients uh, for collections, if you're screening people for your financial assistance policy as part of that process. So let me answer that, Mike. So the, 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 the financial assistant um, policy has has not changed. Um, they're still screening for that. Uh, we do have uh, a firm that actually assists uh, the FQAC and us, and, and um, I want to say they're Valley Health. Um, um, you may be familiar with them, but they help with the assistance and the um, ex exchange uh, market for health insurance. Uh, what what this firm? Uh, mainly is helping us out with is the uh, insurance in uh, third party Medicare and Medicaid claims. Um, okay, so they're working with more with the insurers than with like collecting from patients on the self pay or uh, cost sharing side. Right. Okay, that's helpful. Yeah. Um, and then while talking about slide five, uh, you noted that some of your providers are changing their billing arrangements. And I think you said transitioning to doing their own billing. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay. 
Um, so I just have a couple questions about that process. Um, so first, I'm wondering if the departments that are transitioning their billing practices um, accept the same insurance plans and rates as the hospital uh, to make sure that patients don't receive any surprise out of network bills through that process. Good question. There's there's two areas that we've transitioned that kind of arrangement. That's in um, emergency department, and that changed over in April of 2019. And anesthesia, and that changed over in September of uh, 19, um, a year ago. Um, in their contracts, um, they're required to be uh, signed up for all of the insurance plans that we sign up for. Um, and so that we cover it that way. And um, we also uh, make sure that if we identify um, a patient that fits into our financial assistance program, that we communicate with those two firms to be sure that uh, they honor that um, financial assistance also. That's correct. Okay, that was going to be my my follow up question. So those providers are all covered by your financial assistance policy as well. Yes, Julie, Julie, my team has a, I would say a task force and we, we are up every single month we are making sure we get an update because of the, the nature of uh, attending physicians and, and locums that come in. So we're constantly updating to make sure our roster is, is, is enrolled so our patients are not getting out of network um, balance build, if you will, from from us or those other uh, companies that are doing their own professional billing. Okay, thank you. And that's all my questions. Thank you. I, I see that uh, a member Holmes has a, an additional question. Sorry, I realized I forgot one of my questions on my list here. And I just wanted to follow up. You had talked about stabilizing cash. Um, at the end of the year, you'd be at 30 days cash on hand, which obviously is a great improvement over last year. But in the projection for 2021 um, in the budget, the materials that we got on Saturday, the projection is 15 days cash on hand. And I'm just having heard you say, you know, 30 was what you we were hoping to stabilize cash. I'm wondering if you could speak to the projected you know, how are you going to do with 15 days projected cash on hand for 2021? Um, you, you're catching me off guard because I didn't realize we had taken cash down that low. Uh, what information are you it, looking at? Yeah, I'm happy to tell you. It's in the tables that we received on Saturday. Um, it's the balance sheet and it's at the bottom of that table, which is page four of our uh, the document that we get, um, and it says 2021 budget, 15 days cash on hand. I'm not sure if I <laughs> how I can describe it any other way. It's yeah. the uh, fiscal year budget analysis report date 8 15 2020 for Springfield Hospital, and it's page four, days cash on hand 15. So obviously a concern. That I forgot to raise. <laughs> the, the only thing I can think of, uh, or remember Holmes, is that. Mm, sorry for the echo. Let me mute. Let me mute. Um, the only thing I can do is tell you I'll look into it, but I, I was just, I'm guessing that the person having completed that schedule and sending it in hadn't been linked up with our projections of cash that we do on a weekly basis. And so there's a there's a difference, and they didn't they didn't have the most current information. So. Okay, great. If you could follow up, that'd be terrific. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And member Lunge, did you have a follow up question on uh, Medicare and PSNR? Um, I. So it, I, it's my understanding from our executive director that the PSNR issues were not, um, at least not solely a, ACO related, but maybe Susan could just clarify that. Sure, just um, to clarify the record, what I heard um, said was that the PSNRs were um, 
I don't know if the word broke, if they were, they were broken, um, but that was, they were not broken by the ACO. It was a Medicare operational issue. Um, just to um, share, in fact, yesterday we heard from our contacts um, at, Fatima, at CMMI Fatima that um, this issue is being resolved um, and is, uh, will be communicating out with uh, our critical access hospitals um, this week with updates on that. So I just wanted to clarify the record. Thank you, Susan. Okay, at this point, we're gonna turn it over to public comment. Is there any member of the public who wishes to comment on the Springfield budget submission? I have a question. Go ahead, Dale. Um, it's all a little confusing. Um, Kevin, this is, Susan, Kevin, this is Ham. Excuse me. Uh, Ham, if you could wait, I've just recognized Dale. Oh, no problem. <laughs> okay. Go ahead, Dale. Um, it's all a little confusing. Um, I'm here, it's confusing to you, so I'm okay that it's a little confusing to me. Uh, one question, though, that I do have. I heard him say, or I heard them say, that their primary care practices are not really connected to the hospital. How many primary care practices are in the area? Is there enough to meet the need of the people that live there? And because of the bankruptcy, is there a change in the referrals from primary care as to are they referring to the hospital or are they referring to other hospitals has this affected that utilization that they are talking about? So, Dale, basically there's only three hospitals in the country that um, are owned by an FQHC. Two of them are in Vermont, um, Gifford and Springfield were. Um, Springfield, uh, because of the financial situation that they're in, have um, broken apart that uh, um, coupling together and are attempting to exit bankruptcy as two completely separate entities. And um, I'll let uh, Mike answer the community needs, but from what I understand, the number of uh, clinics that are there, that there's a very strong community presence by the FQHC. But Mike, you wanna take that? Sure, uh, let me try to be real clear. I, I, I don't want any confusion in, in the public. Um, when the two organizations come out of bankruptcy, they'll come out as separate financial organizations, but there will be continued connection um, because it is important that the primary care doctors have a, have a hospital to refer to and be connected with. So that connection will continue. That will not change. Um, uh, I believe that the clinics... Um, have been meeting the needs with primary care doctors in our service areas. And there's multiple areas, not just Springfield. We're in Londonderry, we're in Ludlow, we're in Charlestown. Uh, I probably missed a couple. Um, they, the, the referral of those primary care doctors who are meeting the needs of the communities will continue um, and, and has to continue. For both and actually, reasons. hasn't the uh, service to the community actually increased because now there's weekend availability that wasn't there before, Mike? Right, right. There's there's more hours available for for the community to seek their health care than there ever was before. So uh, that will continue. Please don't please don't think that there's going to be a a, a disconnection between um, the clinics and the primary care doctors from Springfield Hospital. That connection will be will continue to be there and be very stronger than ever, uh, even though it will be two separate organizations. Thanks, Ham, go ahead. Hi, can you still hear me, Kevin? We can. Uh, I wanted to ask Mike, um, the, when he, the first week that he arrived there, he shut down the uh, a new maternity unit in um, in at Springfield because it was losing so much money. Um, 
which was very painful for the community. Um, I was there the day he did it. Um, the, uh, my question is this, um, I, have you looked at the high end of your service lines uh, that might have numbers that have like orthopedics or any other uh, the, uh, high earning uh, surgical procedure, especially that has low volumes and, and uh, both low volumes and um, minimal to no contribution to margin? Yeah, uh, the, 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 yep, the, the, the immediate answer to your question is yes, we're, we're looking at that um, on, a, on a pretty routine per, periodical basis. Um, the, the other factors that have to play into it beyond just the financial, and, and you're absolutely right, it was a very difficult decision for the board to make uh, and, and for the community to adapt to. And I got to tell you, the community has adapted to us not being able to deliver babies. But a hospital like us, a critical access hospital, we can operate um, without um, a childbirthing unit. Um, we can't operate without a surgical services. So not only the factor when we take a look at those kinds of services, in most cases, we're taking a look at it as how, if it's not performing where it should be performing from a dollars and cents point of view, what do we need to do to make that happen? Um, because we, we we would not be a hospital if we didn't have a general surgery uh, department or even to some extent an orthopedic department. Um, so I, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, thank you. Okay, other members of the public? I have one. More. Go ahead, Dale. My understanding from last year, I think it was, in terms of the maternity going away, was there was some talk that there was talk about how would they do this in terms of people in the community that were about to give birth, that that were pregnant, how would they be transported to the nearest maternity? um ward in terms of whatever hospital that is that has one and they were talking about doing some kind of an ambulance special type of ambulance that would be a maternity ambulance did that ever get off the ground did they go anywhere with that how is that working how is the community being served with those needs and thank you very much okay you're welcome let me let me try to answer that question uh, it's my understanding that we have made those kind of accommodations. We have not had very many women, maybe a couple, um, who have come into our ED without having a a uh, obstetrician, um, and and we've been able to uh, take care of those uh, females and and make sure that they get transported, uh, in most cases, to Dartmouth. Um, we have also continued our relationship with Brattleboro Memorial Hospital. And Brattleboro sends their obstetricians here to our campus so that women in this area don't have to travel to that, uh, see their obstetrician uh, prenatal and postnatal. Um, so we've tried to accommodate that um, as well as for the women who, who, who choose not to have an obstetrician until the day they're ready to deliver, uh, which hopefully is very few and we've accommodated those with the appropriate transportation mode to Dartmouth. Okay, thank you. Okay, other members of the public? Hearing none, I wanna thank you, Mike and Alan, for your presentation. Um, I understand there are a few follow-up items that Alan, uh, you're gonna try to clarify some of that uh, financial data and um, I'm sure that Patrick and Lori and Kate will be working with you to make sure that we understand exactly what we're looking at. So um, we thank you in advance for your cooperation with them as we uh, get all those questions answered.